Well, welcome everybody to this uh, COP26 youth engagement event. I'm Hannah Young, I'm the Acting Consul General at the British Consulate in New York. Uh, the British Consulate works with uh, states and cities of New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania and Connecticut to share environmental best practice, including on critical issues like uh, offshore wind, electric vehicles and adaptation and resilience. Uh, I want to welcome you all to this event today. Uh, it comes at a critical time, 13 days before the start of the COP26 summit in Glasgow. Uh, and this is a critical all of society climate event coming six years after the Paris Agreement, where we're asking countries, states, cities, businesses and wider civil society to come forward with even more ambitious climate commitments. Uh, and in this all of society moment, it's absolutely critical that youth voices play an important role in helping shape climate policies for the next generation. Our children and young people uh, will see the greatest impact of the decisions that we take now. Uh, and we are either giving them a head start uh, or leaving them to take even more challenging decisions uh, and drastic action. Uh, I know which of these is the right approach uh, and uh, I want to welcome uh, uh, our esteemed panel uh, who will uh, be giving us some insights uh, from their perspectives. Uh, the UK is co-hosting COP26 and this event uh, with our Italian friends uh, who recently hosted the Youth for Climate Driving Ambition Conference. Uh, and through this partnership, I've been delighted to engage further with my Italian counterpart, uh, the Italian Consul General, uh, Fabrizio Di Michel, who I would now like to uh, invite to uh, introduce and provide opening remarks. Thank you, Hannah. Good morning to all. I'm, I'm really thrilled to be able to introduce the, this event with my colleague and friend, Anna Yang. Uh, we've been working hard together in these months uh, here in New York, in light of the British-Italian co-presidency of the upcoming COP26 in Glasgow. And many important events, as Anna said, took already place, uh, notably the pre-COP meeting and the Youth for Climate meeting in Milan at the end of September. Uh, in that very same spirit, we, we were convinced that reaching out to the youth of the tri-state and Pennsylvania and hear their voices should be a priority. Uh, that's why we have tens and tens of universities connected, including many environmental groups of different backgrounds. Uh, some of them are following on the Zoom platform, but given the big numbers, and we are very happy with that, of course, uh, many other, uh, we are broadcasting live on YouTube. And I wanna thank all of, of you for your participation. So now I'm particularly grateful uh, to uh, Federica Fricano, who is the head of the Italian delegation at COP26, to be with us uh, today uh, in order to share her views on the state of art of COP26 after the important preparatory events which took place uh, recently in Italy. So I'm very glad to, to give you the floor, Federica. Thank you very much, uh, Fabrizio, and thank you very much, uh, Anna, for inviting me to this, uh, to this meeting. I'm very glad to be with all of you and to be able to share um, a little bit of the work that we've done uh, um, in the, 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 last, uh, the, the last month, I would say, the end, the end of September, beginning, uh, beginning of uh, together with our partnership, with uh, our partners, the UK, for, for which we are, you know, partnership, um, all the work uh, um, through COP26. So I will try to share my screen and I will give you um, a, a little bit of a presentation. I don't know, can you see it? I guess you should see it. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Yes, perfect. Okay, thank you. So I will, uh, um, I will drive you a little bit on the work that we've been we've done with regard to the youth for climate uh, driving the uh, driving ambition. 
um, let me see if I'm okay. So, um, so a little bit of background. As I was saying, um, we we in, back in 2019 uh, we we had an agreement uh, with our UK colleague um, uh, through a partnership for the presidency of COP26 with the UK who would be host COP26 and us hosting the pre-COP26 and the Youth for Climate Driving Event Ambition, uh, which was held as I was saying at the end of uh, of, uh, of September, uh, September, and to which and which is uh, was specifically part of the pre-COP. The end of the Youth for Climate uh, event was part of the pre-COP. It has been a, a very long journey. Um, we, uh, in reality, we start working uh, with, um, with the youth um, back in 2019 when we organized uh, um, a virtual, a sort of virtual laboratory of nine online events, uh, which was the Youth for Climate Life series, uh, um, where we discussed together with uh, a lot of participants uh, more than uh, um, 100,000 participants, a lot of uh, issues which are related to, to climate change. And then we get back to uh, the Youth for Climate and, and we ran a selection and we got a lot of, of application and we were very sorry not to be able to bring everybody uh, to Milan, but we managed to select uh, almost 400 participants uh, and maintaining a balance in gender, in regional, and also uh, allowing uh, the participation also for marginalized and disadvantaged uh, group. Uh, it was an, the first, uh, I think it was very successful all over because it was the first in virtual, uh, virtual meeting almost we also had some virtual participation for those who were unable to travel to milan because of the very strict um, still uh, covid uh, covid rules but uh, most of them were in person so i think it was also um, a lot of success also because it finally people were able to meet safely with all the, the health procedure in place but definitely uh, definitely in person so um, and uh, um, the meeting was organized around four teams, um, the youth driving ambition, sustainable recovery, non-state actors engagement, and climate conscious societies. And within these four teams, there were a lot of others, uh, other items that, that the young were able to discuss in their, in their, in their meetings. Uh, there was a little bit of pre pre preparation ahead of this meeting uh, because uh, in order having only two days um, we uh, prepare before the meeting we also had some some uh, virtual preparation we send the questionnaires uh, to all the uh, selected participants in which in which they they share their ideas their priorities their me their message and uh, we uh, prepare a document um, which was uh, um, then um, used during uh, during the meeting a document that contained all the elements that were um, highlighted by the by the participant to the to the to the questionnaires. Um, uh, so these, uh, uh, I think, are the most important part, which the key messages. Um, at the end of the two days meeting, which was a really an, an incredible experience, a lot of ideas, a lot of uh, enthusiasm. Um, you know, looking at the, all these guys uh, working in this uh, uh, round, uh, which we, we call the Agora rooms, it was really uh, fascinating. But so at the end of the meeting, we, we um, they, they were able to agree on some um, on some messages, key important uh, messages. You, you can see some of some of them, um, uh, um, which I will show you uh, um, through the to the slides. I will not go through all of them, but there are many many which are really very relevant and very and very in, and very important, and which are attached to the pre-COP uh, chair summary summary. Because the important part of the meeting was also the sharing of their ideas, the presentation of these ideas to the minister that were present. At the, at, at the meeting, and there was these back and forth question and answers uh, on, on on those on those present on those present uh, presentations. Um, but this is not all in terms of these are the key messages. But we are still working with the youngs to the platform that we established for this meeting in order to finalize a longer document where all the other relevant ideas ideas are in. We 
um, we weren't able to finish that document because with only three, uh, two days, um, it was not possible to having the, the different groups look at the document and the work of the other of the other group. So we thought at the end that it was fair to give some more uh, times, you know, for people to reflect on the entire uh, on the entire document. So. Um, that we will be uh, will be published uh, uh, by the end uh, uh, by the end of the uh, of next week and uh, so and this is the climate conscious society this is a part of which i'm very attached to because it talks about education and environment which i think it's uh, it's one of the most important uh, thing you know to be able to provide education to um, acknowledge uh, the, the the climate change crisis and the climate change challenge challenges with that the guys uh, i mean the young were so able you know to convey uh, to, 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 the, to the entire world, because I, I, one issue that I always saying is that two years ago, three years ago, maybe, yes, we were talking about climate change, but it was always, uh, you know, part of, uh, you know, of our negotiations, part of, uh, you know, the science, uh, um, part of the policymakers, but the, the broader public uh, uh, were not so, you know, into the issues. When the, 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 the young start, you know, realizing uh, the challenges and, you know, protesting about, you know, doing something uh, in order to combat and tackle climate change, Change, then the climate change became um, one more known issues that everybody realized that it's something that will affect all of us and that every one of us need to, to, to take uh, to take action. So this is the part of uh, education I was uh, I was copying, also public awareness and mobilization, the things I was saying, very, very important, you know, so everybody need to be aware that climate change is a global issues and we, we'll, 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 um, we'll, we'll uh, affect every everybody. So so, um, and this is some some not shot uh, from uh, from our uh, from our uh, from the events. It was really really um, a, a, an incredible experience also for us. And then the next step is, of course, that we will bring to Glasgow together with our colleague from from the UK all the message from the from the young, uh, in order to uh, we will have a one one uh, one event on the fifth of November, but also work together with the colleague uh, from the UK colleague in order to um, um, to see how to bring some of those messages into the uh, to the Glasgow Glasgow decisions. So I think that. Uh, uh, with that, uh, I, I finish my presentations. Uh, just one last uh, word. Uh, as I was saying, it was a very interesting, uh, interesting experience. And uh, also one other element is that we would like this sharing of ideas and you know making uh, uh, young people uh, uh, participation more frequent uh, and, and having them uh, you know sharing their priorities and sharing uh, what they are doing because they are doing a lot of things. It's, it's really um, one issue that we will need to tackle and we will need to make more, um, more, more real in terms of, uh, of, uh, of uh, participation. So, so I think that um, with that, I will uh, conclude my petition. I hope that I was able to stay in the five minutes. Thank you so much, Federica. That was great. And um, some really important and powerful messages coming out of um, uh, of the conference uh, that we will want to feed into COP26 and you know a really important challenge for me at the end about how we make youth engagement and youth voices meaningful um, and part of our policy making which is uh, really really crucial. Um, with, with that in mind um, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Anam Ahmed, who is the head of youth engagement for the British government uh, and the UK COP26 presidency, who I'm now going to invite to uh, provide a, a look forward of what to expect at COP26 from a youth angle. Anam. Amazing. Thank you, Hannah. Um, hi, everybody. Good to be here. Um, we are raring to go <laughs> with days before COP. So, um, I think this is a vital opportunity for all of us to get here. Um, so I think I should just start off by saying sort of the past year, I have had such an exciting opportunity to engage with young climate leaders from across the world. I've had the opportunity to meet with 
young entrepreneurs that are leading clean energy innovations in Nigeria to young indigenous campaigners uh, in Brazil who are fighting for nature-based solutions. So the kind of call from young people and the urgency to act is uh, very much kind of alive within the UK COP residency and we've got a real kind of sincere commitment um, to amplify the voices of young people and to give them a platform to connect with uh, decision makers in the run-up to and, and at COP26 itself and just to quickly touch on some of the things that we have been doing over the last year before I move on to kind of a forward look um, we have set up a civil society and youth advisory council which is chaired by Alok Sharma, the COP president designate, alongside a youth uh, co-chair. These meetings have been like a vital opportunity for us to hear from grassroots leaders to shape our planning for COP26 and make sure that they are very much at the heart of our inclusive approach to delivering COP26. In addition to that, as Federica said, we've been working very closely in planning for Youth for Climate, um, and we had a fantastic time last month uh, in bringing that all together really in Milan. And I think the message was crystal clear from young people that um, time is absolutely critical and world leaders need to unite and, and make strong commitments to tackle the climate crisis, um, which sets a strong foundation for us sort of in the last month towards COP. Um, moving towards sort of our priorities uh, in the lead up to COP26, we have got a really kind of strong um, events program running throughout the blue and green zones. So for those of you who have been following our social media activity, we've launched our green zone events and exhibitions program. We've got exciting events led by young people uh, across the two weeks. And we know many of them are actually sold out, um, which kind of gives you a testament of, of how, how wonderful they are. Um, Next week, we will be endorsing and working with um, the 16th UN Conference of Youth, also known as COI-16, which is set to take place from the 28th till the 31st of October uh, in Glasgow at the University of Strathclyde. Um, more details on that are available on their website, but this is another kind of youth activation moment um, to unify the kind of global youth position um, and demands in advance of COP26. Also to say on Friday the 5th of November, so in the first week of COP, we'll be hosting the Youth and Public Empowerment Day. So this is the dedicated day to elevating youth voices, but also showcasing the importance of education and public empowerment in driving climate action. And we've been working really closely with younger and a diverse um, range of youth partners to help co-create the plans for the day. And we're really hoping very soon to publish the events programme for this day, but also all the other presidency theme days across the two weeks. And as Federica said, on this day, we'll be looking to profile the outcomes um, from Youth for Climate to a COP audience. Um, and I think just the final message to say is we've like incredibly valued um, the pressure that young people have been calling uh, to world leaders and kind of the enthusiasm that they've showed in our engagement with them. And we're really hoping that in the last stretch to COP, you sort of continue that momentum um, and that drive. Um, and we look forward to seeing uh, loads of young people at COP itself. So I think that in a nutshell is uh, my speech. I hope that was helpful, guys. Over to you, Hannah. Um, uh, thank you, Anon. This is Fabrizio, and thank you very much, really, uh, for sharing some very important insights uh, on the next steps with regard to the youth engagement. And I think now it's uh, really time to give the floor to the, some of the uh, important youth representatives that we have here connected, web connected, uh, to uh, tell us about their views uh, on the role of youth in the climate solutions, but also how to raise ambitions for climate solutions. And this is very much uh, coherent and in line with the spirit and the content of the Youth for Climate Summit uh, of uh, a few weeks ago. So I'd like to start with Sofia Chiani, who, as you know, is the US representative with UN Secretary General Youth Advisory Group. Hi, thank you so much for having me, everyone. My name is Sophia Kiani, and I'm a 19-year-old Iranian-American climate activist. As mentioned, I'm the U.S. representative on the United Nations inaugural 
Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change, where I advise the Secretary General Antonio Guterres on his climate strategy. In addition to that, I am the founder and executive director of Climate Cardinals, which is an international youth-led nonprofit working to make climate education more accessible to those who don't speak English. Um, so last month, I was able to co-chair the Youth for Climate conference. Uh, so I actually was the co-chair of the Climate Conscious Society theme. Um, and I, I think that the conference really represented an amazing opportunity for young people to tangibly present their inputs on climate policy. And so hopefully uh, what we would like to see out of the conference is that these demands that we've made are gonna be uh, going to be represented at COP and hopefully actually like formally adopted or something is like acted upon uh, so that we know that all these solutions that we came up with were not done in vain. Um, so more about my work, I really am focused on climate education, which is why I was co-chairing the Climate Conscious Society theme. Uh, specifically in regards to climate education, I think it's really important to um, empower youth from diverse backgrounds to engage in climate issues and also uh, for people in general from diverse backgrounds to be able to access climate education. Uh, so my nonprofit, Climate Cardinals, we translate climate information into over 100 languages to ensure that people everywhere can access climate education. As you all know, the UN only provides um, language us um, information usually in the six UN languages. Uh, and these languages account for less than half of the world's speaking population. So there is a huge language barrier when it comes to accessing critical information. Um, which will lead me to my points about what I think that we can uh, continue to expand upon and do better as we like look forward to how young people can meaningfully engage and how we can build upon the results of Youth for Climate. Um, but I will say that I think that uh, establishing youth advisory groups and having young people be able to have a direct line of dialogue with decision makers with people who are higher up in the climate world, I think is incredibly critical. And I love being part of the Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change at the UN. Uh, I think it's awesome that Alok Sharma has also been meeting with other young people. And so I hope to continue to see that model replicated beyond this COP and in other decision-making spaces. Um, and so I guess questions that I have for the Italian and UK government stakeholders, um, as well as like general comments, is that I noticed one of the biggest things I noticed at Youth for Climate that I also heard a lot of um, complaints about was that a lot of the young people there suffered from an English barrier. So pretty much all of our dialogue was written like was entirely in English and most of the participants came from non-majority English speaking countries. So it was very hard for many young people to participate because of this language barrier and there were no translators. Um, and so I guess like a question I have is how can we make sure that people who um, like they don't like English is their second language, they don't speak English well, how can we make sure that they're meaningfully engaging? How can we make sure that translators get into these spaces? Um, so there really is no language barrier in ensuring that everyone is able to meaningfully and concretely present their ideas. Um, I think especially as we are continuing to finalize our output documents ahead of COP. Um, so thank you for allowing me to take this platform and to talk about my ideas and my work. And I look forward to hearing from the other young people. Uh, thank you very much, Sophia. Um, uh, and I recognize Rain Sullivan, who was one of the U.S. representative actually uh, in Milan at the Youth for Climate uh, um, meeting. So he would be able to share his own direct views and perceptions on that event. Rain? Thank you, Mr. DeMichel. Uh, my name is Rain Sullivan, and I had the unique opportunity and the great honor to represent the United States at the first ever Youth for Climate Summit. Um, I also had the unique opportunity to bring the voices of Hawaii as well as other frontline communities at this dialogue. I think for me, youth truly is the refuge of hope. It is the wellspring of possibility, and that was on full display at Youth for Climate. Um, I've engaged in this in many different aspects. I'm an executive advisor for an AI group in England. I've started my own diplomacy nonprofit, but this was truly one of the most unique opportunities I've seen to see uh, young people that are motivated and that were completely invested in not only the success, 
and future of their communities, but of the world as well. Um, you know, I really encourage a lot of folks that are watching this, you know, thinking, how can I get involved or what can I do to have an impact? Or, if, you know, if I'm young, I don't have the experiences that this really is, you know, a this really is a story of our species. It's the context for which we all engage in. And I encourage us all to create a future where we can survive, where we can move beyond just surviving and where we can actually thrive. And I think that youth are going to be at the heart of that. I think they can be the positive drivers for this most consequential undertaking. Um, and I encourage those to not be merely observers on the sidelines. It's a threat multiplier, climate change that affects health, um, security, um, socioeconomic status, um, economies, and you know, particularly speaking from an island point of view, um, it is immediately and pressingly um, existential. And um, you know, I I reflect on the work that we have done and continue to do, and you know, I am motivated by the platinum rule, and I encourage all of those that are interested in this, and particularly our governments, to to adopt this rule. And it is not treat others the way you want to be treated, but it is encourage and treat others the way they want to be treated. And I think that's at the heart of this is local grassroots solutions. It is sharing the story of your community. It is being that steward for your community so that you can you know, advance a truly inclusive and equitable and impactful climate solution. And you know, I encourage all those watching to have the moral courage to step up and get engaged. Um, there is no right or wrong way to engage in this topic. Um, I've approached it from many different angles. And I believe that, you know, there is such an immediate urgency that all of those who want to get involved can get involved. Um, there's a saying in, in, in Hawaii, in Olelo no ea, he ali'i ka'aina he kawa ke kanaka, that the land is chief and humanity is its servant. And it is one of the guiding principles that I have when I approach this work is to approach it with a great sense of humility, to ensure that by taking care of the land, our communities, we are taking care of ourselves and encouraging a sustainable and prosperous relationship of reciprocity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rain. Thank you for, for this, uh, uh, sharing these views with us and, and I, recognize uh, Ariel Lorenzi uh, as a Bachelor of Architecture from the New York Institute of Technology. And we should surely be able to share our own perspective on, on these key questions. Please, Ariel. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for coming to engage with us in this year COP Summit. I'm Ariel Lorenzi, a recent graduate of my university. The architecture department, the New York Institute of Technology. Um, I'm opening up uh, with the word flow, which I saw in uh, Federica Africano's slides, and it is a core value of this summit. So today I want to share with all of you how academic uh, research at my university is about understanding flow and how climate change plays a role in such relations uh, from global to local scales. Uh, um, rapid urbanization, social development, and economic fluctuation several impact the ecology of our landscapes and life expectation. Um, the right to a safe and healthy environment is denied by is denied to many by such endless factors. Nevertheless, climate change aggravates all of those. Um, for example, with time changes as a lake drying up leads to further destabilization of whole regions. Uh, the impact on this interconnected network then opens up hard challenges to the stability of cultural and environmental identities. In addition, youth movements of today underline how accessibility to resources, information, and representation with local government and policymakers is needed throughout planning and implementation processes of climate solutions. The lack of transparency of show, though, um, reinforces the ever-growing concern we all have about how our, our future will play out. Analyzing such interrelated causes and effects can help provide climate solutions that go beyond the standard responses and engage the creative minds of the local community. 
We need a new practice that promotes a more collaborative approach to the world, something that makes us connect um, our human condition to that of our environments. Um, at NYT, uh, the methodology that we implemented to investigate and understand the climate impacts and possible solutions highlights uh, data collection and the need of working with fellow citizens, uh, professionals, and the younger generation. Um, for example, uh, our study case was Turkey, and uh, we observed how texture and porosity of the landscape uh, um, impacts the ability of groundwater to be recharged. Turkey can be this, uh, and Istanbul can be described as cities of stones, uh, concrete, asphalt, and there's a really small pockets of green. So the ability of uh, recharging water is uh, severely impacted, and this leads uh, to um, more uh, problems uh, with resources inside the cities and the whole region. Climate change then um, exacerbates such issues uh, with um, flash flooding. So what we did was uh, exploring how world and specific regions uh, related to one another and within themselves uh, through lenses as such as government, trade, um, environment, energy, and demographics. Uh, from the analysis, we identified underlying themes that carried over how um, our proposed solutions in thesis. And key to this whole analysis was that prioritizing economic agendas over the protection of key biodiversity areas led to the mismanagement of environmental policy, perpetuating ecological disaster and global instability. It is an investigation of a flow. The analysis uh, uh, was done in teams uh, to bridge knowledge and experiences to gain as much as a thorough understanding as possible. And uh, when uh, it was possible, we contacted organizations and local citizens to address their specific concerns. For it is vital when um, we propose the solutions that we communicate to those who live every day in such realities. And this is how we can start uh, to design a resilient solution and a resilient network. Um, I also want to end by saying that protecting our environments is a must, um, but especially rich, expressive, and biodiverse environments matter, for they are likely to support the ongoing development of common ground among participants, which then can lead us to support our future and our future interactions. This complexity provides opportunities for multiple ways of achieving goals and defining success to fight against climate change. This can be furthered by having ministers of education and the academic sector build a stronger connection based on partnership, both inside the school programs and public events. And um, I also want to encourage a circular economies of recycling so that our waste um, doesn't uh, only end up as a waste, but we integrate waste in our lives and better and mitigate um, issues in cities, the countryside, but also entire regions. I hope my presentation inspires all of us to look how our world connects, communicates, flows together, and to realize that protecting uh, the complexity and heterogeneity that will be destroyed by the climate crisis is a task that all of us have upon ourselves. So um, my question so would be more like how all of us, how panelists, uh, our panelists can better engage, understand the flow, not just within like the environments, but especially with government agencies and um, the youth. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Ariel. And allow me just to say on the issue of uh, circular economy and recycling that actually, uh, based on my knowledge, uh, in Europe and Italy, there are a lot of best practices which uh, ideally, ideally should be taken into account uh, here from the United States. And now let's uh, uh, finalize this uh, tour de table of the youth representatives with uh, Zaire Kulot who is the president of Queens College Association of the City University of New York. Zaire, please. 
Thank you very much for the introduction. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, England, and good evening, Italy. My name is Zaire Kalut. I'm a senior public health student and the Student Association President at Queens College. Queens College is a senior college in the City University of New York, the nation's largest public urban university with 25 colleges and professional and graduate schools spread across the five boroughs of New York City. With a population of students bigger than some, than some cities, CUNY has a leading role to play in ensuring a sustainable future. Both Queens College and CUNY and its office, offices of facilities, planning, construction and management are committed to doing their part to combat the climate crisis. At Queens, we have taken many measures to reduce energy consumption. Our campus has undertaken several energy efficient projects to replace energy impacting infrastructure and legacy lightning systems with LED technology. We have expanded our green infrastructure on our 80 acre beautiful tree line campus. We are proud of Sustainable CUNY, a program that aims to make New York City more energy efficient. It has taken major steps to increase solar use and energy resiliency in New York City. In 2006, CUNY established the New York City Solar Partnership, a collaboration with the New York City Economic Development Corporation and the Mayor's Office of Sustainability to help lower solar costs and enable homeowners, businesses, and community institutions to connect with and commit to solar opportunities in the neighborhood. While we are proud of these achievements, we recognize there is still so much work to be done. We must all be a part of the solution in order to confront and end this crisis. This is the most critical global challenge of our time. We are already experiencing the disastrous effects of climate change, whether it be through the relentless wildfires of California, horrific hurricane damages in Haiti, biblical floods in Germany, or extreme water shortages in India, just to name a few. Here in New York, the remnants of Hurricane Ida recently created historic floods and wrecked havoc on New York City. It was possible for at least, it was responsible for at least 46 deaths in the metropolitan area, according to the New York Times. These deadly outcomes will only increase if we don't reduce global carbon emissions drastically. There is hope for a better future. My generation is the first generation raised to understand the urgency of the climate crisis. We are better equipped to take on this challenge than any generation before. But just knowing about the need for change is not enough. Our youth need to take action and we have been taking action. And together we can play a major role in stopping the most devastating effects of the climate crisis. We are the generation that is poised to become the decision makers that can potentially save the human race from a global catastrophe. We are the generation that will feel the greatest effects of climate change, if not stopped. In order to end this crisis, all youth everywhere need to be active in the decision-making process in local, national, and global levels. If we do not act, our future children will grow up in a hellish world that we can't even imagine. We have seen the impact that young people can make on fighting against the climate crisis. Greta Thunberg and her inspiring climate strikes are a perfect example of that. There are many other young people doing incredible work, but we need more people to get involved and we cannot delay any longer. The solution to climate change already exists. The UN's Global 13 House outlined a plan that can combat the world's worst of the climate change. The big challenge is the lack of will to implement these solutions, but how do we motivate everyone to act? By continuing to create awareness is a big step towards slowing climate change. And every walkout conference or article written helps our fight. Enacting laws that incentivize measures to reduce global emissions is what is needed most to stop climate change on a larger scale and will get everyone involved. I urge our local, federal, and global leaders to work together to find solutions that will be beneficial to our communities in both the short term and long term so that everyone is motivated to take action. The alternative to anxiety is action. Action now before it is too late. And my peers, Sophie, Rain, and I, all touched on collaboration and all touched on governmental support so that we can act. Thank you very much. Brilliant, thank you so much, Zaya. And thank you to all of our amazing youth speakers. Um, and thank you for all of your leadership on this crucial issue. Um, we're now going to um, uh, reintroduce our Italian and UK COP26 speakers and uh, as, as our youth speakers were talking, um, a number of them ended their comments with uh, questions for um, our COP26 speakers. So um, I'm going to repose 
uh, some of those questions um, but our panel should also feel um, comfortable jumping in if they uh, want to add further questions or have any particular thoughts. Um, and then I should say that we will uh, save a good chunk of time for audience questions. Uh, I know people have already started to put those into um, the various chat functions um, and we will try and uh, get through as many of them as possible um, for the whole panel. Um, but maybe I could kick off uh, with um, Sophie's uh, question, and I'm afraid Sophie's had to uh, leave us, but I will still ask her question, which was around um, uh, language barriers and accessibility. Uh, so I think the question was, how can we make sure that uh, discussions and conferences like COP COP26 are as accessible as possible. I think that was with it with a particular eye to uh, recognizing that for a lot of people English is not their first language. Um, but I'd be really keen to hear from uh, Frederica and then Annam uh, for your thoughts on that and, and anything else about how we make these discussions as accessible to as diverse a range of people as possible. So perhaps Frederica, if I could ask you to come back in first and then uh, yeah. Anna, please feel free yeah, to jump sure. in. I mean, this was one of the problems that we we faced uh, um, from the beginning uh, um, when choosing uh, um, how to arrange uh, how to arrange for this meeting, uh, having uh, um, no much time. I mean, only two day and a half of uh, of, uh, of meeting. So we choose to uh, to have the round the, the meeting in English just for a logistical purpose in order to to make to maximize. The, the timing of um, available uh, for uh, for the people uh, for the people to talk because making arrangement for translation is always very um, uh, not only logistical difficult but also implies uh, implies more uh, um, more time. But yes, this is an issue that uh, um, that affect uh, sometimes the participation of uh, uh, of uh, people to 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 this kind uh, of meeting. So it's it's uh, for us it's an experience by it's a learning by doing. And um, since this is, uh, was perceived as one of the barriers um, to, for the participation, then uh, of course this is one our main um, issues for the next time or for advising those that we hope uh, after us uh, will continue this series of, of, of engagement is to, to make that um, the possibility of people uh, you know, to, to participate in their own, uh, in their own uh, language, languages. So it's a, it's an it's an issue. It's a real issue, and we know. Anna, I don't know if you wanted to come in uh, with any thoughts you have, including on COP twenty six and plans for um, for making that as accessible as possible. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, I'd echo Federica's points. Really, um, a lot of these uh, logistical. Uh, things are organized by the UNFCCC as part of a COP presidents. Um, I think Sophia's points were very apt and I think remind us of how like grassroots leaders are kind of pioneering these initiatives and shining a light on these issues and I think actually after COP26 for the next presidency this is something that we should all come together and and chime on and, and highlight. Um, I think we have tried our best to deliver a safe and inclusive COP and hopefully that you know comes to light um, but I think there is work to be done post COP in really drawing out some of these issues. Great thank you um, and Anna while you've got the floor I might also um, pose Ariel's question uh, and actually we had a we've had a similar question through in the audience chat around how we can continue to engage uh, uh, how we can encourage uh, rich dialogue uh, and uh, engagement between young people and governments. And you talked a little bit about the work that Alok Sharma has done setting up a committee, um, but I wonder if you could say a bit more about either that or other initiatives that you're, you're taking. Yeah, absolutely. Ariel, thank you for the question. Um, I think we see a lot of these forums that are set up um, and I think that's fantastic, but there's great stuff that are being led by young people themselves. So one clear example is mock cop, 
right? This was uh, held in November last year. It was an entirely youth-led movement. They held a virtual conference and brought together over 100 young people from across the world. Um, and Alok Sharma was able to participate in this conference. And to supplement that, we then did sort of some training sessions where we brought some of our negotiators to actually interact with the young people who are part of that movement. So I think the more that um, we can see young people driving these innovations, then we can really kind of latch onto that and say, well, this is fantastic. We need to be part of that discourse. So I think it's a two way thing. I think there's formal structures that we can set up, such as um, Sophia's group, the UN Secretary General's Youth Advisory Group, uh, Alok Sharma, Civil Society and Youth Advisory Council, but there's also a plethora of initiatives that young people are leading themselves where they are putting themselves out there for, for decision makers to interact with them. So I'd say that keep doing what you're doing, um, sign up to these initiatives if you've not already done so. I think the other key sort of player in this area is Youngo. Youngo are the official children's and youth constituency to the UNFCCC. You know, they represent 10,000 plus young climate leaders. So they are there to follow negotiations. So if you are looking to hone in on a particular policy area, whether it's climate finance, adaptation, loss and damage, education, they have got working groups in all of these different areas. So I definitely consider being part of that uh, constituency, and you will therefore get access uh, to decision makers. Hope that's helpful, guys. That's really helpful. Thank you. And thanks for highlighting those initiatives. Um, Frederica, is there anything further that you would want to add? Yes, of course, on top of what Anum just said, of course, you know, participating to the many initiatives that are youth lead, um, you know, being part of the younger constituency, official constituency to the UNFCCC, uh, of course, there is a lot that the also government uh, government can do. And this is part of, uh, of the message that we wanted to convey through the Youth for Climate, you know, how it's possible to engage youth in, their, in the decision making uh, process. Uh, there are some uh, good examples around the world on how countries are organizing themselves through um, to, to uh, consultative uh, process uh, uh, all over when uh, you know exactly when when deciding on uh, policy on climate change now we heard a lot by Ariel and rain about the local uh, locally owned solutions uh, now how you you have to you know to really look at the issues of climate change from the local from the local perspective Perspective. And this is very important. So what young can do is, uh, for example, a message that we want to convey to the Youth for Climate uh, participant is, uh, yes, we will convey your, your ideas, we will convey your priorities, we will make, uh, you know, all the commitment and the, and the ideas that you, you put in the, the Youth for Climate available to everybody and try to push a COP26, uh, you know, to have a, a government engaging on these, uh, on these priorities. But there is also a, a lot of work that you need to do in your own country because at the end we are a government and we can decide for for our own government but of course we can ask other government to do things but we cannot oblige them to to to, to make their certain choice so it is important that um, that you keep on working in their in their countries in their government in order to to have their voice heard in order to you know to to convey this uh, this, uh, this this kind of this kind of message, this is uh, absolutely absolutely important. Great, thank you, Frederica. Um, and actually, I'm going to pick up on your point around local solutions. And uh, as you say, Rain in particular, I think emphasise the importance of finding local solutions. And I'm going to open this question up to the panel. And maybe Rain, I'll I'll start with you if it's okay. Um, really keen to um, hear a little bit more about. What local solutions, including anything you know, very particular uh, that you've seen that have had the greatest impact so far? Sure, um, I, I think sort of touching upon my work in Youth for Climate, um, within the working group three, I was specifically involved with the entrepreneur um, sub team. And so we were looking at different facets, whether it's resource availability, um, internet access, uh, one of the places where I lived um, in Oahu in Hawaii, that is majority Pacific Islander and native Hawaiian, um, fundamentally did not have reliable high-speed internet. And I actually had to move to the capital 
uh, Honolulu to be able to do uh, law school remotely. Um, so, I mean, there are just sort of fundamental inputs that I think all governments um, from, from a national, subnational, international level can do to encourage entrepreneurs because fundamentally many of these solutions have to be locally driven. You know, in Hawaii, there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of uh, companies and ideas that are relying on indigenous knowledge, particularly of there's a system of development called the Ahopua'a system of land division and a system of reciprocity, but also a circular economy um, that has been adapted um, by many different folks. So I think that entrepreneurship within this space could be critical um, in empowering local entrepreneurs to not only you know, fix the solutions with their community, but also provide crucial data um, methodologies and templates that then can be adapted for, um, you know, other communities um, and an international scope. Thank you. Um, Ariel or Zaya, did either of you want to come in on this question about um, local best practice or anything that you've both worked on where those local solutions have, have been really beneficial? Um, I'll try to come behind Rain here. Um, I think um, lobbying and advising. So um, making sure that like um, we can work together, but without like support um, from like governmental support, it's so hard like to get things done. So um, lobbying, um, advising um, our elected officials, uh, making phone calls, sending emails, and seeing the best way that. Um, we don't just wait to get heard, but we actively work towards like making sure our voices are heard. Um, I want to continue on uh, what Sarah was saying. Um, in my experience, uh, um, what happens usually is that there is a lack of direct communication and feedback uh, with the from the local community to um, government representatives. So um, proposals uh, um, which uh, work have like a lot of um, data behind them, uh, have like entire communities behind them, aren't really picked up or more like they're picked up and then um, shelved because there's no person like uh, legit like in person, not to just the agency, but someone that they can refer and then hear back. So that's what happens usually when the um, solution in like smaller scales uh, um, dissolves and in nothing it gets done to um, to help ameliorate. Uh, and because there's no, not even like the amelioration, the situation worsen. So, um, what uh what would be more useful in this case would uh really construct a network that you can rely on the community entire communities and singular um individuals can rely on and have constant feedback so that um there's there's shown that there's engagement and then um the proposal becomes more effective. Great, thank you very much. Um, and I really, I really like your um, comments, Aya, about the importance of lobbying and political activism with, you know, local leaders. And Ariel, you've reinforced that. Um, Frederica, I've got a question for you, um, just about um, explaining what adaptation and resilience actually is. I think it's a phrase that we use a lot. Uh, particularly in the COP26 world, but can you just talk a little bit more about adaptation and resilience and, and how it relates to emissions reductions, please? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, well, adaptation, adaptation. Um, you know, this is a, a question that I've always been asked by the journalists. You know, they try to understand <laughs> what is exactly happening at the COP and what we spend, what, what are the issues we are discussing, and then the, 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 we spend the nights and days in on 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 single on single issues. So adaptation. 
Um, unfortunately, um, we are uh, fully aware of the fact that climate change is already happening. And no matter what we will do, um, uh, we will have to adapt in the future, which means that we will have to make our environment um, uh, adapting to a changing uh, climate, which means that, uh, for example, the coastline uh, might change because of the increase of the level of the, of the, of the sea. So when you build in the coastline, you will have to make sure that your, your buildings are made in a way that uh, do take into consideration those kind of, uh, um, of changing in the, in, the, in, the, in, uh, in the environment. And this is a, a one very important issue. And it's, I would say it's the most difficult issues to, to do at government level. So make uh, um, people understanding and when you project uh, your country when you 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 build strategies uh, in your in your country you always have to factor in climate change because you always have to forecast what your country will be in the next 10 20 30 years uh, considering that climate change will inevitably happen and then you have when you decide to build something or when you decide to to even to 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 um, advise a community you need to advise them on what will change and how their their environment will change and then they have to factor as i was saying they have to factor in the climate change uh, the climate change in their in their uh, in their planning because climate change will change the climate will change the way we live we might change the way we produce the way the agriculture the water the, avail the availability of water the drought the, uh, the, the 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 kind of uh, of rains you will have in the in the future now we you, we've seen uh, uh, this uh, uh, this last uh, um, uh, last uh, this year uh, what's happened for example in Germany. Uh, with uh, with very heavy rains um, that fall down and then entire villages which were destroyed and this happens in many parts of the world so adapting to climate change means factor in the changes in climate that will anyway um, occur and resilience means exactly you know resisting and how to say you know adapting to the climate change and build your environment and your community in a way that the damage are i wouldn't i wouldn't say are completely controlled but uh, um, are, are in any way um, bear, bearable, why would I, I would say. So this is what we, we say when we talk about climate change, uh, adaptation and resilience. Thanks, Federica. And um, Rain, you talked earlier about it being existential to you. Um, I guess this is absolutely crucial from where you sit. Could you tell us a bit more from your perspective? Sure. Um... I would say, you know, honestly, I'm not a fan of adaptation and resilience as, you know, a buzzword. I think it's a cop out and I think it is, you know, um, disingenuous to the immediate threats that communities face. Um, you know, to borrow from Vanessa Nakate's speech at Youth for Climate, there is no adaptation for the loss of culture. There is no adaptation for the loss of communities and history, and there is no adaptation for extinction. And coming from frontline communities in the islands, um, there is no adapting to the sea level rise. It will swallow an island entirely. And that is a human and a planetary cost that we simply cannot face. So I think when I, when I, when I encounter this, I'm a little disappointed because it you know, shows sort of the, the, the disparate way that this is often treated. Um, you know, Hawaii is the extinction capital of the world. There are more species lost, flora and fauna, than any other place at a faster rate. There is, no there is no adaptation to the destruction of communities that I drive through and the sea level is um, coming up onto the road or to all of these species that are found nowhere else on planet earth. Um, and all of these ecosystems that not only have intrinsic value but also have many other um, facets and resources whether it's healthcare derivatives, it's inspiration for biomimicry and material sciences um, that can be absolutely crucial to the success of communities, um, both locally and, and globally. So I, I would just caution those that, that embrace this adaptation and resilience to understand that for many of us, particularly um, island communities, there, there is no adapting. It is here, it is now, um, and it is existential. 
Yeah, if I may, Anna, if I may, I, I of course completely agree with Rain. I mean, it's uh, unfortunately, um, there is a certain limit to what you can adapt. No, there is a there is a picture. There is a picture which I I always um, one uh, um, the, the the focal point from the IPCC, the Italian focal point for IPCC, used to show to explain people how difficult it is to adapt is uh, having a cow with, with that fly. You can you cannot adapt to everything, of course. Um, and it's true that absolutely uh, mitigation. The more you mitigate, the less you have to adapt. Uh, of course, so it is. It's crucial that we do mitigate and we have ambitions, targets and goals so to, uh, to um, uh, mitigate our, our, uh, our, um, our emissions. Uh, but it's also true that at the end, of course, there are radical uh, ways for adapting, but there are also issues that we need to do in any case to adapt to, to a, a climate that whatever is going to happen, if we stop emitting now in this moment CO2, anyway, the CO2 is still is already in the atmospheres. And if we will not have technologies that will allow us to capture the CO2 that is already in the atmosphere, we will have to adapt. So we hope that we will not arrive to the level of you know, having a disappearing community or disappearing island. And we, I really hope that, and this is really in the hands of you know, having, uh, being, ambitions, uh, being ambitious and being uh, you know, um, looking for um, more, more actions on climate change. But it's also true that you will have to, ta to tackle the issues of uh, adaptation in any way. Thank you both. Um, it's a really, a really important and powerful challenge, Rain, um, by you. Thank you for that. Um, I've got another question actually for our youth speakers, um, which is, and, and some of you have already alluded to this in, in previous answers, but um, somebody asks, how do you suggest I get involved with climate change activism? Uh, which I think is a really important question. Um, I'll, I'll perhaps open this up to everybody. Um, maybe if we can start with Ariel and then uh, Zaire and then Rain, and then I'll come to Anum and Frederica. Um, so I think ways to get more engaged in, of course, like it's participating, um, participating in such events, um, raising awareness, but I think like there's also like little ways. Um, of course, like I'm not um, a believer like of like um, in a way like it's not just like um, using um, paper straws instead of like plastic straws. Um, of course, like that can help, but like the big action needs to be like we all know who are like those um, what's felt like like the industries. Um, make such a use of like CO2, uh, emit such uh, huge levels of CO2. Like it's not just um, the plastic source, but like there's a smaller actions uh, that um, also needed to be take, uh, they needed to take place. Uh, um, um, for example, like um, uh, I think uh, was uh, Fabrizio that uh, was mentioning it, um, how recycling, uh, I, I brought, um, in my um in my discussion i was uh talking about like the circular economy of recycling and um Fabrizio brought on how um america can take uh, um some examples of like how italians uh, um practice recycling in uh, i'm going to be more in detail for like my case um i currently like live here in new york city um but i grew up in italy so I know how different the two methodologies of like recycling are. are. Um, in Italy, um, there's a really like these uh, huge, um, at least for like cities, uh, you can uh, recycle like the organic. Now, nowadays, like it's really in the last few years here in New York City, I saw stations uh, to uh, recycle. Uh, where you can uh, bring like your organic leftovers and they can recycle and then like they can uh, give you compost. So um, encourage you also like to 
participate in uh, community gardens, um, do something if you have space, uh, which is another issue in the cities, if you have space, uh, engage in some um, activities of such nature. But um, I think uh, that um, one can go and do such. Um, so like I participating in uh, smaller uh, um, activities such as those also, it doesn't need to be loud in, in a sense of like, we think uh, many times that actions such as those uh, need to be loud, but also forming smaller collectives, like even dragging your family and doing something like this, which um, can help to build like a culture for the future. So it's not just something that stops at you, but uh, you can perpetuate this idea to like um, your neighbors, but uh, inside your family. Um, yeah, I think something like smaller scale, um, such as these actions can help. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's great. And, you know, those are the kind of things that everybody can get behind. Uh, Zaya. Yes, um, thank you, Ariel. I'm just going to piggyback on what you said. Um, so I think um, number one is believing that you can um, help with the climate crisis. I know like a lot of people like um, don't believe it's possible or I've seen that that rhetoric that we're too far gone and just like looking around us and seeing like that's not true. And um, again, coming to forms like this, um, joining local initiatives, um, local community boards, and remembering that like there's always like strength and unity when you do what you do there's always strength and like people backing you and again um as ariel said um doing what you're comfortable with there's no um form of advocacy that's correct advocacy um if you're comfortable with writing an email do that making a phone call do that um if you're more outward and um you want to um lobby to people um on social media pages, um, do whatever you can um, to make a difference. And no way of making a difference is right or wrong. Just the only wrong thing I think is inaction. So um, just being active and doing what you can locally to make a difference globally. Um, I'm going also to continue on Syria. Um, something that I saw in my experience is that what happens uh, is that there's a project uh, um there's a uh, some like there's uh, some proposals but like the community is not engaged so i want really like to um to say like try um try your hardest to be engaged in your community board because uh, this is where even like outsiders uh, if even if like there are only proposals of solution proposals uh, um this is where they happen. And this is where like the community gets to decide. So try to make, stay engaged with the such government bodies because like in community boards, at least here in the US, like anyone can get in. Like there's really like not so like many certifications, like I can get in at the community board like, and then I can make a change. So this is where um really, one should pay attention. Great, thank you. Uh, Rain. I also wanna echo some of the points made by my fellow panelists. Um, I think if you're already here, you're asking the right questions. There is no right or wrong way to get engaged. Um, and I think to echo what Federica said earlier, um, there's a learn by doing. You know, in Hawaiian, it's makahana kaike. You have to learn by doing. Um, I know that even when I was launching my diplomacy non project, I just had this idea and I said, I want to get it done. It was about climate change and international security. I just went to embassies and I knocked on the door and I said, Hey, can you talk to me? Let's get it done. Um, so I think, you know, from a technology perspective, we're always talking about prototyping is if you have an idea, just try it out, see what the community involvement is. And I think that speaks to sort of one of the core focuses that I encourage people to do is storytelling, is know the story not only of yourself and your family, but know the story of your community. And whether that's in getting engaged in, you know, local boards or, or news or volunteering, 
um, but it's about preserving and advocating for that story first and foremost. Um, and I think it's also about channeling your passion. This is something that demands a whole of society response. So there are many channels, whether it's art and expression creatively, there is entrepreneurship, there is sports, there are so many different facets that people to engage in um, beyond just sort of lifestyle changes um, that I encourage you to, to just try it out and do. Brilliant, thank you. It's always good to uh, know that there are no wrong answers. Um, thank you, Rain. Um, Anum, and then Frederica, same question to you. How can, how can people get more involved? Thanks, Hannah. I think building on what Ariel said, there is like different scales, right, for involvement. So you can start by creating awareness within your family, then your local community. If you're part of a faith community, that can be really helpful. And then, you know, maybe setting up a group in your school, in your college, in your university, um, you know, to do that advocacy work. And maybe you could even start creating changes at that level. So, you know, encouraging your university to switch to more clean energy sources, for example, um, or raising your profile through social media, which I know Sophia has been doing really brilliantly. So I think there's things that you can do on the local level. And then if you want to be part of sort of the multilateral, framework then it is worth thinking about okay would I like to be part of Youngo for example a constituency like that um, to take my influence to the next level and actually become a specialist in a particular policy area um, so I think it's worth thinking about the the reach that you want to have and what you want to target so would you like to do a community level awareness raising or would you like to lobby governments um, or would you like to set up your own small you know, business or do some kind of entrepreneurship, lead your own local solutions? So I think there's, there's a myriad of things that you can do. And I think there's lots of kind of how-to guides out there on um, how to take your interest into that kind of campaign world. And I would say start building your network. So this is an excellent forum to do that, right? Connect with like-minded people who are on a similar journey to you. Um, and then take it from there, I think. Frederica. Yes, yes, well, yes, I very much agree with what Anu just, uh, just said. There is one thing that I like a lot of what Ariel said, that um, you don't feel, you don't have to feel necessarily the pressure. You don't need to be loud. There is no necessity of being loud, you know, because there are all these examples of big activists, but it, 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 it doesn't have to go that, that way. Uh, for uh, You need to be informed. And once you inform, you can inform the others. You, you, you need to be curious. And if you are curious, then you are able to inform the other. You can, you can be locally involved. You can start, as Anu was saying, from your family, from your family, step by step, and then be locally uh, involved. Talk, talk to, the, or to the young, talk to the others. One thing that was uh, one positive feedback that we had from the Youth for Climate was exactly this one. Uh, people who came to us saying thank you for giving me the possibility to talk to others who thinks like me, who has project like me, who has an experience in their own country, you know, doing specific project and I'm learning from their experience. So the, the beauty of that meeting was yes, everybody together, yes, key fundings, yes, the document. But in reality was the possibility of having people coming from all over the world get together and talking about their experience, exchanging their, their ideas. And so by exchanging your ideas, you create new ideas and you feel like you are not alone and that there are other people like you and you build the network, which is our, our very important. You know, the young are so good in networking, much better than us. You know, as soon as we create the platform for the Youth for Climate, they created a WhatsApp group for every for every single single group, and they already start sharing sharing, sharing their ideas and their and their and their and their projects. So this is uh, it, 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 in a way it's much easier for them, you know, to get uh, uh, to get the to get involved, and they can decide at which level they want uh, they want to go. Thanks, Frederica. I find WhatsApp groups are the answer to most problems. Um, uh, 
Uh, we are very close to running out of time. So um, I'm going to hand over in a moment to Fabrizio to uh, close out the session on behalf of the UK and uh, the Italian consulates. But before I do, I'm going to ask each of our panellists one final question. And I think it's uh, probably an unfair question to ask. Uh, but in one sentence, could you please tell us what you are most uh, keen to see come out of COP26, uh, which, as I said at the beginning, starts in... 13 days. Uh, Frederica is the Italian lead negotiator. I think we should start with you. What are you, what are, in one sentence, what are you looking to see come out of COP? Well, being also the, the, as Italy, the president of the G20, we, we really would like to have all G20 countries to take bold commitment on, 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 on mitigation. That's what it's our, it's our main hope uh, for, for COP26. Thank you. I'm now going to come to Annam and then Ariel. Thanks, Anna. I think on our side, we, we want to be able to leave COP saying we gave a platform to young people, civil society, indigenous peoples to have their voices heard at COP. And for us, for me, I think that would be success. Thank you, Ariel. Um, I hope we go behind um, just like mitigation plans, um, just agreements that are left in the air and nothing comes out of it. I really hope like this time we can establish a line of communication that touches from the government, goes to state uh, government agencies and tries to pull as many people as they can inside one line of both, but also like, it touches not to just this generation, but like it prepares uh, the future generation. Thank you, uh, Zaya, and then finally, Rain. Um, this is a running joke of me piggybacking off of Ariel, but um, basically um, people like seeing results from like what they put in, like to inspire others to do the same. So maybe um, maybe we can come up with like a strategic plan or like a calendar of things that like we can achieve um, to be able to inspire um, COP going forward also. Go for it, Rain. Last but by no means least. <laughs> you know, um... My grandfather always taught me, you have two eyes and two ears and one mouth. So listen and observe more than you speak. I really hope that at COP there is a sense of humility. Um, and I'm speaking particularly for um, my government, the United States, um, as well as others in the G20 as Federica um, acknowledged. And core to this, I really hope there's a great sense of accountability, truth be told. And accountability necessitates ambitious action not by 2030, not by 2050, but right now. And so I really hope that that is imparted on all participants and that there is, you know, this sense that the action must be taken um, immediately. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, everybody. I'm going to hand over to Fabrizio now to uh, close the session. Uh, thank you, Hannah. Uh, and before really concluding, allow me to say, just a very few words on the very important issue of adaptation and resilience, because I listened very carefully uh, to Rain and Federica, and I, I, my understanding is that their views converge in the same direction. I mean, uh, working for resilience and adaptation is a necessity ready now in the interest of people and communities. But of course, this cannot become a pretext or a kind of fig leaf for governments not to take bold actions. And now, uh, let me really uh, thank again uh, all of our brilliant speakers, uh, both the institutional representatives from London and, and Rome, and but particularly, uh, if you allow, the, the youth representatives, because this event at the end of the day was conceived for them. And I think it's clear by now to everybody, including a policy making level that youth voice on climate change uh, cannot be uh, ignored altogether. I mean, the Youth, climate, Youth for Climate Summit, the meeting was unprecedented. I don't know, um, actually, I don't even hope that 
the results of that meeting will affect the results of COP26 in Glasgow. But this is a consolidating pattern and it's a positive one. Of course, it will take uh, more time and further efforts to bring young voices in the decision-making process. Uh, from this perspective, I'm particularly glad that together with our British uh, colleagues from New York, not only New York, but the Tri-State and Pennsylvania, we managed to make a, a leader contribution in that spirit and in, in that direction. Or at least I hope we managed to do it. So thank you again to all. Thank you to Hannah and our British uh, brilliant counterparts for organizing this. And we surely follow up with other events like this. Have a good day.